Good morning. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 307 RPG Podcast. I'm Patrick. I'm Nolan. Nolan, tell me some fun, interesting stuff that you've done in gaming this week, because I've done very little. I also have done very little, worked on some WoW stuff, uh, very little with time constraints, but uh, we also started our Scarred Lands, right, this week? Yes, we did. That was fun. Yeah, playing through the Gauntlet of Spirit Ghosts and giving a couple of new people a chance to see that and remembering how much I've forgotten, so I was pleasantly surprised by some stuff that happened, which was fantastic fun, so... You know what I like about the Gauntlet of Spear Ghosts is that it is a free adventure on Drive Through RPG. You can go and pick that up, the the PDF of it, and you can play through it just to get yourself an introduction to the Scarred Lands, which will lead you to the this is the the next two, the Dagger of Spear Ghosts and the Ring of Spear Ghosts. Uh, of course, those are paid. Uh, the neat thing is, is you can get all three of those um, in print on demand format so if you still want the actual paperback book because that's what it comes as you can order those and they're again i rave about drive through rpgs pod's they are really good um i ended up buying all three of them for our original time that we played through it so it is it's fun to go back and play through this again because it's a really well done story yeah and i don't think we got to finish the trilogy so i'm looking forward to that uh, the characters have been neat. We've got kind of a bag of mixed races, which is a fun part of Scarred Lands. Uh, and then just playing another ridiculous character that kind of makes stuff up as he goes and trying to write down how he acted so I can try and do it again and not forget what he said and that kind of stuff. So it'd be fun right. to play a paladin. It's been a while since I played a paladin. So. Well, and you're 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 a fan of Paladin, so it's going to be good for you to get back into the saddle and play that again, and and not be in Stradland where everything was trying to kill you because you were like this radiant of good. Yeah, I'm sure we'll get there eventually. It is Scardlands, so. Well, and it's, and it's me, and and no, everybody knows I actively try to kill you. So. I am I am up for the challenge this time around. So should be fun. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, the only bit of gaming I've gotten to do this week, aside from playing Scarred Lance, is before we logged in this morning, I, I was up a little bit early and I did log into WoW and got to play for just a little bit, played through the rest of the, the whole uh, Riven Breath uh, scenario, which is a lot of fun, really reminds me of Innistrad um, when I was playing through that, I, and I really like that. Uh, I did, I'm at the point now where I have to choose a covenant for my Demon Hunter. Uh, as you and I have talked, I am going to be going tank for the most part, so I'm going to spend some time reading through the different covenants and find out exactly what it is I should, well I shouldn't say exactly, but what I prefer towards towards my character seems like they've done a pretty good job of keeping most of them within a few percentage points. Uh, each one is kind of different based upon kind of what you're wanting to do. I know some are a little more heavy towards tank. Some are better if you're playing all specs. Some are better if you just DPS. Some are better if you PvP. Um, and it's it can be fairly easy to catch up, which is nice. And it's fairly easy to switch at least one time. Uh, it's a little more difficult to go back. So if you start with Bastion and abandon him for Raven Dreth, Bastion looks a little, a little harsh upon you of trying to go back and make it a little more difficult. But uh, the abilities are fun, and some of the some of the things are just crazy good. Uh, I know, like the the Raven Dreth get like a Blood Door of Shadow step, which on a Demon Hunter isn't necessarily amazing because you've got a lot of mobility. But on a Paladin, all of a sudden you get a blink. It, it's pretty cool. So. They're fun. They're they're an interesting way, and the campaign story is great. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Um, I like I said, I'm to that point where I'm so I'll be doing some reading this week, uh, probably later today actually, and make that decision. I'd imagine I'll log in later today and just go ahead and take care of that. So we'll see. Uh, I, you know, I, I did tell you I, I did sit down to try to play Cyberpunk. I haven't really been playing it because I've just there's just been so much going on. And I know once I sit down to play that, it's going to be an investment. It's going to be a time investment. So I sit down to play it and fired up my Xbox and, oh, <laughs> oh look, my HDMI cable's dead. So I got to go buy another HDMI cable. It's like every time I try to play this game, something goes wrong. And it just yeah. feels very indicative to the situation of that game. I will play it. I will, because I love the genre of cyberpunk. But I got to go buy another cable. <laughs> it's hard to get motivated when something goes wrong every time you try. I can't hear a word you're saying, my friend. Your lips are moving, but I can't hear you. Oh, nice. Yep, still can't hear anything. We have lost Nolan. There we go. There you are. I was going to say, it seems like that's kind of the... Uh, it's really hard to get traction going when every time you try and start something, it just kind of peters out. 
Yeah. So we'll see. I, I'm sure I'll get to a point where I get to play it. And maybe it's this summer when I don't know. We'll see. Uh, this week, Nolan and I are going to be discussing the themes that are present in the Altered Carbon RPG. It seems like when the last one we put out about that video, we got a, at least one person saying, hey, do more Altered Carbon stuff. So we, we are going to go ahead and do talk about the themes. And, and possibly next week, we might get into some of the system a little bit. We have reached out to Hunters Entertainment uh, to see if we can maybe get one of the writers from Altered Carbon to come on the show. I'd love to have one of them come on and actually go over the system with us. That way, it's not Nolan and I trying to fumble our way through it. Uh, it is, again, I can't stress enough, this is a beautiful book. I think right now you can only get the PDF on Drive Through RPG, but we'll get that to that, to that later. So before we jump into that, let's take a look at the news. Uh, Nolan, this was a last minute addition to the show notes last night, and I know I did send them to you after I wrote this in, so I just wanted to go over this with you. I was uh, contacted by a gentleman by the name of Jackson from the Viditage podcast um, through a voicemail on Anchor. I I didn't even know you could send voicemails through Anchor. I was just stunned that all of a sudden I'm getting this voicemail through Anchor, and I listened to it. And Jackson was asked was asking me um, what we thought if if um, they should redo, and I'm assuming Watsi in this case, at least through the licensure, if they should redo the Eye of the Beholder video game series in 3D format, and um, if that's something we would like to come on the show and talk about. So I, I messaged him back once I figured out how you could do it through Anchor, uh, and him and I went back and forth quite a bit last night is to the point where I was like, okay, dude, I'm, I, I need to go to bed, so I'm just going to stop talking. Uh, we did agree that I'm going to go on his show and chat with him about this Eye of the Beholder older video game series uh and and just you know kind of go over that with him he does he's got a pretty neat little a YouTube channel. He's just getting started. He's got a neat little YouTube channel where he does um, music over video montage. Like he's done stuff from Karate Kid, uh, from Cobra Kai, uh, some other things like that. Uh, so I, I did watch a couple of his videos through him a sub, um, but I will be going on Jackson's show and we're going to actually take that and just put it out on our site as well. It's just a special little show. There, I don't know if we'll be able to do video. We'll see. It might just be um, audio. So Either way, we are going to get something out there. But in short, Nolan, are you familiar with the Eye of the Beholder video series at all? Video game series? I'm not. It's funny that we are looking at this uh, today because I think we were just yesterday looking at like the top, what, five old school Pathfinder games. And they have almost the right. same art. And I forgot how the box looked and that kind of stuff there. But uh, I, I am not familiar with it. It was nice to kind of take a look at it. I like... I, I feel like I played it, but I don't remember playing it. You know, kind of like when you'd go to the YMCA and they had the computer room and you got like 10 minutes on the computer before the next kid came in. But, uh, well, and cool. you, you may be too young to remember. Um, did, and, and of course, I wasn't in Sheridan at the time. Um, do you remember going to like the, the video store and renting video games? Yeah. You're like, yeah, I think that sounds like a very archaic practice, but sure. So I did when I was younger, um, cause I think, uh, I, the older came out in the early nineties. And so just, just so everybody knows, uh, there's three games in the series. The first being I, the beholder and the, I, the beholder deals with the Lords and ladies of Waterdeep have called you to, or have tasked you with diving into the underbelly of Waterdeep to confront none other than the Xanathar, the eponymous beholder who lives beneath Waterdeep. Um, and that's kind of what you're going to be doing. And I do believe in the video game, you actually slay the Xanathar. Now, I remember renting this video game from Box Office Video, which was a local store in Fairbanks, Alaska, and playing the game. Unfortunately, you got to rent it for, what, two days? And so, like, you played it, you played it as much as you could, but you had to balance, you know, your work schedule, your life schedule, and all that other shit, and take it back. And I never beat the game. Um, but it was fun. Uh, and again, there's three games in this series. So I Beholder 2, The Legend of Dark Moon, uh, uh, Caliban Blackstaff meets you at a tavern in, in Waterdeep and sends you off to the Dark Moon Temple to investigate the evil brewing there. And then the third game, um, the Eye of the Beholder 3, the assault on Myth Dranner, the party is trying to save the ruins of Myth Dranner from a lich by the name of Aquellen, if I remember correctly. Um, so yeah, some really neat, neat stuff with that. And of course, as we sit here and talk about these names, Nolan, you're shaking your head. You're like, yeah, I know that name. Yeah, yeah, I know that name. And, and it's nice to know that even these older games, you could jump in and still recognize some of the stuff and be familiar with it. I mean, it's the unforgotten realms, we should call it, because it's the sword coast. We all know what happens there. 
Uh, in short, yeah, Jackson, we would love to talk about this game. We love the idea of having more D&D video games, and it would be a lot of fun to discuss it. So I will be doing that uh, sometime this week, and we'll be getting that out for everybody. Um, I I think I've told you before, Nolan, there was a a D&D game that I used to play. <laughs> I may have told you the story. I used to, my buddy and I, we used to play a lot of D&D. And we'd stay up very, 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 very late and then go to work and then come home, never sleeping. Well, there's one time I sat down, I was like, I need to play this game. And the name of the game was Warriors of the Eternal Sun. And this is a Sega Genesis Super Nintendo game. Uh, and I loved this game. Like I was hooked. When I wasn't playing tabletop D&D, I was playing Warriors of the Eternal Sun. And uh, I remember one time I'm playing, and we had played D&D &D all night, worked all day. I'm sitting there, and my younger brother's like, hey, hey, Pat, are you going to wake up? <laughs> I was sound asleep and holding the forward button, and my party was just bouncing off a mountain wall. And they just couldn't move any further because there was a damn mountain in the way. Um, Warriors of the Eternal Sun was one of those games that I got so frustrated because I went through the final dungeon, did everything I was supposed to do, and could not find the end boss. So I was working at box office video and a guy came in and I believe he actually rented Eye of the Beholder, come to think of it. And um, we were talking about D&D &D games and I mentioned Warriors of the Eternal Sun and how frustrated I was that I couldn't beat the game. And he's like, oh man. And he explains the final map, right? And, and I knew it very well. And he's like, dude, it's this corner right here. There's a secret door. You just have to walk through the wall. And I'm like, what? It's like, yeah, you just got to walk through the wall and then you fight the final boss. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so I went home, fired it up, walked through the wall and beat the game. Oh my gosh. That would, that's fun. Oh, I can't hear you again, bud. I think there we go. Huh. Yep. There we go. Yeah. So it was a fun game. I love games like that, that drive you crazy. And, and then it's the most simplest thing. Yeah, which is almost frustrating because you're like, really, that's it? But I was thrilled because I finally beat the damn game. Put that chapter of your life behind you. That's right. All right, so let's jump in the news. So speaking of D&D, &D, as fans of D&D &D know, there's been talks of a D&D &D movie as well as a D&D &D live action series. When it comes to the movie, we recently learned that Chris Pine has been cast to play some character. We don't know what yet. Uh, but we also recently learned from The Hollywood Reporter that Derek Kolstad, the creator and writer of the John Wick series, has been tasked with creating the pitch for a Dungeons & Dragons live action series. Nolan, are you a fan of John Wick? I love it. Me too. So this is pretty exciting, I think. I, I'm i hoping, 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 hoping it's good. Like, we need a good one. We do. And and I think, I mean, we've seen so many really good live action series come out. Um, Altered Carbon, which we're going to be talking about later. Um, Carnival Row, which I happen to freaking love uh, on Amazon. Um and others, I mean, we have the Cimmerillion, the, the third age of, of Lord of the Rings coming out soon. Um, so there's there's a lot of stuff that I think they can do, and hopefully it's done well. And I think with Derek Colstead involved, maybe there's going to be a lot of fancy sword play and some really cool stuff. So I, I, I don't know, but I'm excited. Well, I think he proved with John Wick 1 that he can do a lot with a little. Um, I think that was kind of the big thing about it, and nobody saw it coming and became incredibly popular. And with that being the case, hopefully people will be like, yeah, I like his style, I want to be a part of it, and they can pull in some people that want to do more, that have love for the genre, and uh, the, the potential's there. But it's also a right. huge undertaking, because we've said it before, so much stuff you know, compares to Lord of the Rings and taking something and doing it right, and then looking at like World of Warcraft, which was, I don't think, made anybody happy. Um, I think it was neat Sad. to see some stuff, but you know, at the same time, we're like, oh, that's, I wanted, I wanted more. You know, and I really like Travis Fimmel, uh, who was the main character in World of Warcraft. He did a fantastic job as Ragnar Lothbrok on Vikings. Mm -hmm. um, so I was really excited to see him in that. So it was a little bit sad. Um, I, I didn't think the actors were bad. I just felt like there was a lot of, I don't know, there was a lot of stuff that felt weird. Like right, just that little, right. their own telling of the story and and I don't know. I don't know. Try to do too much. 
Right. I was just looking at chat real quick, and I see Jackson from Vidage uh, has jumped in, and I, I wanted to. He was talking about Baldur's Gate, and I saw you responded to him real quick. I know you're a big fan of the Baldur's Gate games, um, and it's a big. You know, I unfortunately for me, when Baldur's Gate came out, I was more into Diablo two at the time, so I didn't give it a chance. I was so focused on Diablo two. I'm excited about the stuff that's coming out, uh, the new video games that are coming out. I, I think it's going to be really neat to see some of that stuff again. Um, Quickly, Nolan, tell us your thoughts on the original Baldur's Gate games. Yeah. I, Is that something you could do quickly? <laughs> I don't know if I can. Uh, you know, I, I think it's one of those things If I started to play Shadows of Om, quickly became kind of addicted but confused at the story, and quickly went back and played it because I was kind of in the same boat. I was playing Diablo, Diablo 2 at that time. Um, I, you know, it's it, it really set the tone for the choose your own adventure, pick your stuff. You know, you see the stuff that came with Knights of the Old Republic. You see the stuff that became of Mass Effect. Uh, Dragon Age uh, became more streamlined and simple of that. Uh, but the, the storytelling was great. I remember the characters. I think the, uh, man, it, it was just so good. And the hardest part of that was trying to learn advanced D&D rules and second edition stuff. Um, just because it didn't make sense at the time to put on armor other than, okay, I guess the lower it is, the better. Like, I want a negative 12. Um, the weapons were cool. The quest for the weapons were amazing. Uh, there's a couple of them that, like, uh, I think it was called, like, the Flail of the Ages, where it was, a like, a flail with one head, and as you would go through and do random stuff, you'd randomly find different flails to attach to it, and each one would do, like... 1d4 lightning 1d4 acid until eventually you had one that was the whole spectrum of damage so when you'd hit somebody it was like 6d4 um and all elemental types and just i don't know there's those little things uh minsk and boo became very popular uh, npcs around you it, it, it really did it just it kind of set the tone for oh this is what a big story is and 200 some hours later you know beating the game and just kind of sitting there and just not knowing what to do myself uh and then not really having that feeling again to like after like lord of the rings was over you know where you just sit there and you're like wow that, that that's it like this is this is the end of something of my life like there is finality to it it's so i don't know shortly yeah now, i can't but it it's great uh i'm excited for Baldur's Gate 3 uh doing the beta on there i'm excited for dark alliance um, cause I really like the, uh, the hack and slash, uh, Baldur's Gate games that they did as well, but also being a Diablo fan. Um, yeah. There's yeah. It's interesting one. that Jackson reached out to us about this cause you and I were discussing video games yesterday while we were at work. So it just really coincided with our theme of the day. Jackson's also asking about the game Myst. I played Myst like once or twice, but couldn't get into it. Did you ever play that one? I did not play Myst. Um, he was also asking about EverQuest Online and Old School RuneScape. Uh, Dom's in there talking about Bard Sale. So we appreciate you guys chatting. I, I didn't play Myst. Uh, I played original EverQuest. I did not do the online adventures. Um, but I still play EverQuest about once Yes, you do. <laughs> because I get the nostalgia. So, yeah. So, yeah, they're good. Yeah. I've told you our my EverQuest story, haven't I? Where where we got it for free off of eBay. Did I ever tell you about that? Yeah, didn't have it. Yeah, didn't have a key, so we couldn't play it. And Dom, um, just real quick, the Bard's Tale wasn't actually D and D. It was just as uh, its own standalone role playing series. Uh, a fantastic series. I love the Bard's Tale. It's actually what got me into computer role playing games. So, uh, but anyway. Let's let's move on because we do have some stuff that we want to talk about before uh, we get into our topic of the night. Um, so again, back to the D and D live action show. We're very excited to see what Derek is going to come up with. Hopefully, it's great. Uh, I I love a good series that I can dive into, and there's been some really really good ones lately come out. Um, that like, in fact, I've gone back and started rewatching the Altered Carbon series because I like it so much. Um, Whiz Kids, did you see the Critical Role miniatures they're coming out with? Yeah, I saw that they were doing like a monster collection, which I think, uh, you know, I've seen some of the stuff that Matt has built out of a conglomeration of like Warhammer and just monstrosities he's created uh, for the game. So if he actually gets to bring some of those to life and let us play with them too, I'm pretty excited. The The art so far looks really good. Uh whether those are actual or just like pre-production models, I'm not sure, but they look frightening and tell a tale, that's for sure. 
Yeah, so WizKids has announced a partnership with Critical Role to produce a line of pre-painted miniatures from the world of Exandria, which, as we all know, includes Wildmount and Tall Um Nolan was just saying they, they look amazing. I love the Blood Hunter. He looks badass. Yeah. So according to the press release from WizKids, the model should debut in Q1 of 2021. Some of the models included, like I said, are the Blood Hunter and a gargantuan size Udak. I think that's how you say it. Um, I do have a link to the entire press release in the show notes. So if you guys want to check that out, as well as some pictures of the models. So if you guys want to check that out, you can find that in the show notes. Nolan, did you see anything else for D&D? I did not. I didn't either. But we're in that time period where things are moving slow. It's just, uh, it's winter. So let's bounce over to the Onyx Path. Uh, Onyx Path has launched their Kickstarters for Scion Dragon and also Scion Mask of the Mythos. Now, what I understand, or I was taking a look at it last night. This is one Kickstarter landing page where you can choose to do either or or both. So um, this funded in about, what I say it was about an hour. I was looking, I think the initial ask was 35,000. They are well over 100,000 already. Uh, Scion is apparently very pop, a very popular line with Onyx Path. I did reach out to Neil Raymond Price as well as Rich Thomas at Onyx Path to see if maybe we can grab somebody to come over and join us and talk about these two books. And it may be one of those, I haven't heard back, which is unusual for Onyx Path because usually they're pretty fast with responding to me. And it could be one of those that they are so absolutely insanely busy with how quickly this thing funded that they're trying to get shit done that they just don't have time um they are ripping through stretch goals guys so if you're a fan of scion and these are something you're interested in i do have a link in the show notes for you to go check out that kickstarter um also this week, the complete PDF of Yugman's Guide to Gelsbad, which Nolan and I have covered in detail, was released on Drive Through RPG this week. Now, if you were someone who purchased all editions of Yugman's Guide to Gelsbad, you should have gotten an email that will give you a completed PDF with the official cover. Uh, I did not see a print-on-demand option for this book, which is unfortunate. I was kind of hoping maybe we could get a paperback book, and maybe that's something that they're working on. I don't know. Um, but I do have a link in the show notes for you guys to go and grab your copy of that uh like i said keep in mind it is only being offered in the pdf format which i don't know when you and i when i shouldn't say when you and i when we sit down to play D, &D i oftentimes like i have dual screens on my my computer like what you have like 10 right something like that on yours <laughs> um, really so i'll ones. have yeah i will have like uh, of course the game that we're playing on my main monitor i'll have this you know something off to my right hand side or yeah right hand side and then on my left i usually have my tablet which has other things. So I do move between all sorts of things. So I, I don't mind having PDFs. In fact, I kind of like it because there's less opportunity for me to spill shit on my books because I'm bad about that. I think, but, that's the, I think that's the only tough thing for me is like you get used to searching through books uh, so I can grab it and go versus like clicking through the PDF or scrolling or sometimes it doesn't load, but... Uh, I know when it comes time to move or clean, not having 500 hardbacks is going to be nice. So. Yeah, that's true. I, I look at my bookshelf and I'm surprised it doesn't sag with the weight of the books that are on. In fact, I'm constantly having to cycle out books like, uh, okay, well, I haven't messed with you in a long time and I just got this new one in. Let's put this up here and put this one somewhere else. And uh, yeah, it's, um, <laughs> but I do love books and it, I will continue to buy them. a lot of stuff. I, and I think that's the big thing is like, it, there's something about holding it. There's something about feeling it. And if there wasn't, they wouldn't put out, you know, the amazing alternate art covers and sell them for 20 bucks more for no reason, you know? So speaking of alternate art covers, I keep this one right at hand because we are indeed playing through Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. It's um, also yeah, a good looking I, cover. <laughs> also a good looking cover. In fact, the, the new cover for um, the new D&D &D book coming out, the uh, Mysteries of Candlekeep looks amazing. And it's something I'm going to reach out to Halen about here pretty soon to see if I can get a copy of it. Yep, I like that one a lot. I think that one's a good. I mean, it 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 would be one that you wouldn't even necessarily need to open; just look cool on your shelf. So, right, because it looks like a classic tome. So, that is all the news I saw from uh, Onyx Path. Um, I there's just, again, we're in that slow period where there's just not a lot going on. I did see that uh, Cults of the Blood Gods. You know, the the files are being sent to the printers, so hopefully we're getting closer to actually having a hard copy of that book, the Kickstarter version of that book. So I am looking forward to that as well. 
Um, I did want to jump over to Tolis real quick because there was some interesting stuff that came out with them via the pre-order. Um, Monty Cook Games, as I just said, does have a pre-order page now available for Tolis. Uh, and speaking of books, Nolan, how many books are you getting with that one? Uh, you know, I think I'm getting the giant one uh, for that. And then I did get five of the player's guides. So each player that we have can have their own copy and get familiar with the world. Um, and then I got everything in like PDF through drive through RPG of all the 3.5 stuff. But uh, another one of those, uh, I think it was just under 700 pages. So I cannot wait to see that box show up. Yeah, the UPS guy is going to have somebody else with him to help carry that up to your porch. Yes. I remember when I got um, from Simon, Cool Minis or Not, uh, when I got Rising Sun and Zombie Side, I came home and there was this massive, very heavy box sitting on my on my porch. And I'm like, oh, shit. So I'd imagine it's going to be something like that for you. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And again, it's one of those things of it's coming up quick, which is nice. It's expected in March. Uh, feels not necessarily forever ago, which is, I mean, I feel like it's been fairly quick. Um, but I'm also like a Kickstarter for uh, Crowfall, and it's been three years now of in development yeah. on a video game. So for these books, taking a year or so is not that bad for me. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and of course, I've got some other books that I kickstarted through Onyx Path that COVID has really slowed down. And actually, if they get Cults of the Blood Gods out, I think that will beat a couple of the other books that I backed, like uh, Mummy the Cursed. I think Cults came out after. So uh, I don't know. Um, so anyway, it does say that the street date for these books is going to be April, which I suspect means you are going to see that March date, probably late March, but I bet you you will see it. Because it does say that the, those people who do pre-order, your copies will be shipped to you two or so weeks. And it does quite literally say two or so weeks uh, before the street date. Again, the street date does appear to be April. Um, I I have to imagine you, you know, as someone who backed it, you're going to be in that pre-order group. Now, we did reach out to Monty Cook Games. We've reached out to them a couple times now, and we have been contacted back. Um, and it does sound like they are trying to get somebody to come on our show to talk about Tallis as they get closer to the release. So that's something Nolan and I are both really excited about. We'd love to have somebody come in because Tallis looks fantastic. And again, I have the link to the pre-order in the show notes, guys, where you can go and look at some of the artwork for these books. And holy shit, they look great. I Their page looks amazing. I mean, I just like cycling through it. I like seeing the world. Uh... I'm, I am looking forward to it just because it really is being in a different world where there are no sets of rules, which, I mean, there are, but um, you can play anything because the big bad is the tower in the middle. So be right. an orc, be a goblin. Like, everybody's here to adventure and see how far they get. And, you know, they get to floor four and they're like, you know what, this is it. Now I go back and start a, a keep because I'd like to live or I got just enough money and other people are going to challenge the whole tower and everybody's kind of on edge of what happens when the boss at the top wakes up or will that ever happen? So I, I think that stuff is going to be fun just because then it's like grab whatever you want and bring it to this world as far as a monster goes and play it. And everybody's cool with it. You want to be a drow, you want to be a minotaur, you want to be an orc, a goblin, you know, whatever. Let's do it. Bring them out. It's not going to be weird. There's not going to be any fighting. There's no drama here. Just pick your class. And then it being just this giant world, what they had designed it for was playtest. Um, and so what he wanted was a, if you can't make it this week, well, your nan's at home and she's sick. And guys, I can't go in the dungeon today because I got to take care of, you know, grandma. But I'll catch you on the next trip because that's what people do every day is they go grab some loot from the dungeon, fight some monsters and go home and sleep in their bed. And uh, it's just about ease of access, not 10 days on the road because it's the dungeons right there. So good luck. Yeah, it's kind of neat. And I, I, you know, honestly, I wish there was something that they had taken into effect when it came to Dungeon of the Mad Mage, because I felt like when we were playing in that, that it was just a slog that you were, just, and, and even Tomb of Annihilation. Um, you just felt like you were stuck in that dungeon for so so long and 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 even though you're sitting at a table you're you know you're in your room whatever um i do feel like it gets to a point that um you just begin to feel oppressed feel claustrophobic feel like there's no end in sight and you're going to be forever in a dungeon yeah and i think that's uh you know i think there'll be some interesting 
opportunities there too of finding teleportation stones or setting up little areas that will allow you to you know fast travel so being able to skip or move around that stuff as needed would be pretty cool um again it's a 700 page book i i am looking forward to seeing what it has to offer agreed absolutely agreed um anything else Fran told us before we move on uh, that was it that was what i saw this week as well cool so we have come to our topic of the night uh, like we mentioned earlier, we are going to be talking about the themes that are present in the Altered Carbon uh, RPG. Uh, again, we had somebody reach out to us on YouTube asking us to do more Altered Carbon stuff. And, and truthfully, when Nolan and I usually do a look like this at stuff, we usually spend a couple of weeks on it anyway. So it made sense to go back and take a look at it. Um, before we do move on, though, I, I, I do want to mention, you know, we had Zach Goins on our show last week to talk about Drifters Quarterly. And I think it's fantastic that they're doing that. But Zach lost his grandfather this week. And I just wanted to offer our condolences to him. Um, it's never easy to go through something like that. And he was very close to his grandfather. I'm sorry to hear that. And uh, I hope if there's anything you need from us, just to talk or vent or do something nerdy, take your mind off of it. We're here. We like doing that stuff. So Exactly. So, all right. So let's talk about Altered Carbon. Um Again, Ultra Carbon is currently available on DriveThruRPG in the PDF format, and it's actually currently number 12 on the hottest selling items on DriveThruRPG. There is a link in the show notes for you guys to access this PDF. Uh, I, I hope you're able to get a copy of the hardcover book soon. I got it through Kickstarter. It is fantastic. Uh, and Nolan and I have scrolled through the PDF. The artwork in it is pulled, a lot of it is pulled directly from the show. Uh, these guys worked on the show, so there's they have really good working knowledge of it. So we're going to dive into some of the themes real quick. And, and well, I shouldn't say real quick, we're going to spend a little bit of time on this. And, and I'm going to kind of kick us off. I want to talk about the theme of cyberpunk. And I just, yeah, there it goes. Okay. I rave about cyberpunk. I've talked about not just the cyberpunk game, but about cyberpunk genre in general. And I just want to talk about what is cyberpunk and what kind of got me hooked into it. Uh, according to the book, cyberpunk is a postmodern genre and an astringent antidote to a wild-eyed wonderland of science fiction uh, from the likes of Jules Verne and H.G. Wells. In those stories, ordinary people are exposed to fantastic and terrifying technological marvels, whereas cyberpunk technology... Uh, banal and tawdry, an endless nuisance of electric hums and flashing lights. There is no longer any wonder or awe. There is only a desperate search for purpose in a bleak neon world that has long since abandoned hope that the next discovery will inject a sense of adventure into humanity's grinding existence. And this is so true. Um, so just give you examples of cyberpunk that you may have experienced in media. Um, the classic, well, classic to me anyway, I thought it was fantastic. Uh, Johnny Mnemonic. Have you ever watched that one, Nolan? I have. It's been a while. Um, and I think it's one of those things of when you saw it, I didn't realize what I was watching type situation. It was just kind of a weird thing. And I didn't, you know, kind of was my first introduction to the genre. Right. Uh, Keanu Reeves, Johnny Mnemonic, he's a courier where he slips messages or stuff into his uh, chip in his head, and then he makes a delivery. Um, very, very futuristic and totally cyberpunk. Uh, and I think that may have been my first cinema introduction to cyberpunk, uh, but it wasn't my first introduction as I had been reading science fiction novels that were unknowns to me, cyberpunk in relation. Um, so cyberpunk in popular culture, of course, if you want to talk, whoops, there I go, scrolling past things again. Obviously, the cyberpunk video game. You, you can't go wrong if you want to experience cyberpunk by playing the cyberpunk video game or reading the cyberpunk novels or even learning about the cyberpunk RPG in and of itself. You do get that feeling of, you know, augmented human beings where they have enhanced eyes that are almost mechanical. Um enhanced arms or limbs or, or guns that literally come out of their, their wrist because their arm is completely modified or swords and so on. Uh, Richard K. Morgan wrote the Altered Carbon series, and it's not even the Altered Carbon series, it's the, it's the Takashi Kovach novels, and there are three of those. Um, all of them fantastic. Then there's also other, these are his literary predecessors, Philip K. Dick, who wrote Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, Total Recall, Minority Report, also cyberpunk. Uh, you guys should recognize Total Recall movie and, and of course even Minority Report. Neil Stevenson wrote the book Snow Crash. Are you familiar with Neil Stevenson, Nolan? I'm not. 
This was one that was recommended to me more than 20 years ago by my older brother. Um, and I remember reading it going, wow, this is something else. Um, the idea being snow crashes quite literally when you turn on your TV and the cable's not working anymore and there's just snow on the station. Um, computers doing that in a futuristic world would be called a snow crash. Uh, deals with a courier, a samurai. Um, interesting, interesting story. It's been, like I said, over 20 years since I read it. I probably should reread it. Uh, another very well-known cyberpunk writer, William Gibson, wrote the book Neuromancer. And these are just to kind of give you guys an idea of a few. And I wanted to make sure we mentioned that because if you're looking for um, – an introduction into cyberpunk here's a great way to get that cyberpunk has been very prominent in anime um ghost in the shell is a very cyberpunk um yeah. uh show and, and i'm sure that, like i think it's it, it's influenced a lot of things uh just from that standpoint uh you know uh i, I you could probably consider the matrix uh a variation of it very uh, much so uh, in in its own form uh fifth element uh, just kind of that futuristic, uh, interesting one. I really like uh, uh, Minority Report. Uh, Blade Runner was a good one. Uh, yep, I was just about to say Blade Runner. Uh, the uh, Shadow Run games, uh, and then I, I was thinking about the was it the Deuce X games were pretty popular growing up that I didn't get into, but I know that was along it. So it you can find little aspects of it in a lot of everything. Um, I don't know that I've seen it to this point of almost sadness that we get with altered carbon yeah you know and, and it's interesting because I'm, I'm now reading the second book um broken angels and i in fact last night i purchased the third book woken furies and there is absolutely uh you're right there's a sadness um and, and for those of you who are a fan of the show uh i think i've said this before the season one and season two are a conglomeration of book one uh, which is called Altered Carbon. So keep that in mind. If you do end up watching the show and you read the books, you're going to find aspects of the show from both seasons in book one. Broken Angels is completely different. They're on a completely different task and doing something different. Um, so yeah, some neat stuff there. And and I agree with you. As you watch or even read about Takeshi Kovach and, and how he deals with everything, because he's, he's technically been alive for a couple hundred years. Hmm. Um, and just the sadness, the the loss that he's experienced, I think, and, and then juxtapose that with uh, Bancroft and the stuff that he's gone through in his several hundred years of life, um, where he's thrilled about the things he does, and he's almost not even human anymore because he's lived for so long that he just doesn't care. Yeah, and I, I know in the book it has a section that says, you know, if you or other players are familiar with Alter Carbon and or Cyberpunk in general, skip ahead of uh, this area. Um, and I think I did the first time I read it um, and kind of going through because it's like, okay, I got an idea. Then looking at going through and reading it and deep diving a little bit more, I, I guess there's a lot of stuff that I want to go back and watch the show because I think I was so attached to trying to figure out what was happening and, and that the mystery that I kind of – I think I missed a lot of the world going on around it and, and, and seeing that, you know, like I kind of felt like I was looking, you know, from watching the show, you're like, oh, you know, of course it's kind of that he's in these dark areas. He's in these bad parts of town. He's dealing with a murder. He's dealing with criminals. Um, and then kind of realizing that that's just kind of the whole state of everything. The whole world is kind of grungy and dark and dirty and, uh, in the in that in the core concepts they talk about uh, because you have everything most people have lost the spark for something more and that's kind of is that what makes humanity is growth or or having a desire to you know if i want for nothing do i no longer have the drive to achieve anything and and people are broken down and and I don't know. It's, it, it is really sad. It's a really cool world. I can see the, the idea for a rebellion or a resistance. Um, anyway, yeah, it, it, it was. It was it was way, way sadder than I thought it was going to be. Um, I realized I ignored a lot of the stuff that was going on around everything in the, the show. Uh, but I don't know. It's, it's, it's fascinating. It, it gets really deep really quick. 
It really does. And and I think it's interesting that you talk about missing stuff because, like, like I said, I'm re-watching the series now. A lot of times it's on while I'm doing other things and I just come back and look at it. But it's amazing how much I forgot of season one. And and it, there is that, that whole, okay, we have everything, so now we're just going to be as deviant as possible. And it's interesting when you put that side by side to something like Star Trek, where Star Trek is in the future and Gene Roddenberry, Gene Roddenberry, sorry, I, I was trying to say wrote and Roddenberry at the same time there. Gene Roddenberry wrote Star Trek in such a way that because of technology, humanity has been able to put aside their differences and move forward in a peaceful manner. Whereas with Altered Carbon and even Cyberpunk, it's not that way. Technology has indeed um, improved our lives, but by the same token, it has made us, and this this goes to the theme of transhumanism, which is evident in Altered Carbon. Um, you no longer have, you start to lose the human aspect. Like, like you said, you begin to have everything. You begin to like, uh, so uh, I have to go back here. So for those of you who don't know, um, you in, in Altered Carbon, you have you are a DFH a digital or DHF digital human freight, and I think it was in in the timeline of the game around was it twenty ninety nine Nolan I can't remember where they actually created the first cortical stacks. I I think it was that was the first time that they were able to do so with the Martian technology where it became good. Like right. I guess they were there, but it would take you like three to four weeks to upload. Like it, and now all of a sudden it became. Like they took that tech and ramped up to 11 where you can upload in seconds. Right. And you mentioned the Martians. Gosh, there's so much with this game. The Martians are considered the elders. And they don't even know that they're Martians, but they found the most predominant and oldest civilization on Mars. So that's why in the game they refer to the elders as the Martians. And interestingly, interestingly, gosh, wow, I really can't talk. Interestingly enough, uh, in Broken Angels, like they're on a completely different world, but they are actually going to a Martian dig, and they have there's uh, an archaeological site there during that they're trying to access during this war. So it is. I mean, the Martians have spread out all over, and what they have learned is that the Martians, wherever they have created a civilization, wherever the elders created a civilization, that becomes the center of their universe. So where Mars was the center of their universe, here where they are now in this other story, that is the center of their universe there and so you get to see like okay we see the bulk of their stuff happening here uh but we do see remnants on this world and on this world and on this world so really interesting stuff that goes on there um yeah they, and was, I th they were what avian based i guess is yes. what they were and so they found that to be very bird-like they would build their nest and go um and I, I, again, I think some of that stuff I, I just completely missed. I mean, I, I know I remember seeing like the the fossilized creations of the bird wings and the rich people's place, you know, and that kind of stuff. Like that's how rich they are; is they can have a piece of it. But uh, I don't know. I <laughs> it's just that that layer that I just completely missed, and I don't know how. I mean, I thought it was great. Right. Uh, so yeah, and it goes right back to the whole idea of transhumanism and i'm trying to bring my copy of the book up real quick um but also let's i want to talk about um the concept of neo-noir because this is like one of the first themes that they mention in the book and i had to really dig into this a little bit to figure out what neo-noir neo-noir means mm -hmm. and it says neo-noir revels in the exploration of the moral gray and if you think about it, if you're if you've watched the show like you know like Riker was a police officer right and Riker was on the take um, but he was a good co or good air quotes here. He was good at his job. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean he was a good in character cop, but he was good at his job. And the reason he was in jail was because he was on the take and he was a corrupt cop at that point, but he was good at his job. And so you deal with this whole moral gray issue. Um, it says the best neo-noir stories tell a good mystery and solve a good crime involving government overreach masquerading as be benevolence, corporate intrigue, tyranny, paranoia, corruption, and even bittersweet romance. Goes right back to Ortega and Riker, you know, they had a romance. Then Kovac comes in that sleeve. Ortega's trying to deal with the fact that it's Riker, but not Riker. Um, some really, so, and I'm just trying to draw quick examples from the show to uh, some of the themes that are in the game. Um, I really like this idea of neo noir. I like this idea of 
and it almost like you mentioned earlier about this feeling of hopeless hopelessness like no matter what you do you can't break through and and it really is an altered carbon because the corporations kind of control everything yeah and so what i liked about the world was is once they started leaving earth the un became uh, this global authority figure and the only people that could really rise up against them were the corporations um only the big corporations. Uh, and so I was trying to think about all the parallels to now versus what's there. And some of that stuff is, is like, uh, you don't show up for your work. There's another person in line for your job in, in a lot of places. Um, but here, since nobody dies, <laughs> the, the, the workforce is there. So you take your 525 an hour job and if you don't want it, they will just pull somebody out of a stack and, and give it to somebody else and away you go. So there is no there is no growth. You have to take what you're given. And, and when you're talking about that, you know, th these are the welfare handouts is not out of the goodness of their heart. It's out of control. It's, it's we're here, we're the good guy, we're helping you live. Um, but you really don't have an option. You take what you're given. Right. And here's an interesting real world correlation to altered carbon that my wife threw at me last night as we were discussing some of the themes that are present in this game. So we all know COVID's a big deal. We all know that we have two companies, Pfizer and Moderna, creating the vaccine. Well, what I think is interesting is Pfizer is creating the vaccine with governmental money. They've been funded to create this back vaccine. They're you know, getting subsidies and such so that they can create this vaccine for us. Not only that, they also have a patent on the vaccine. So they got money to create the vaccine. They're throwing a patent on the vaccine so no uh, generic version of the vaccine can be created, of their vaccine can be created. Quite literally a corporation controlling a vaccine. And it's, I mean, obviously we're very simplifying this. I'm not getting into a, hard, a lot of hardcore details about uh, Pfizer and the politics behind it because that's not what we're doing here. But it's a real quick real world example of a corporation controlling something that is very, very necessary for human beings. Well, I think the, the general idea of a lot of stuff works as long as the people involved are good. And yes, and I think that's what you see a lot of this stuff. It, it starts that way. It, it, and I, th yeah, it starts that way. Most evil the best evil the best bad guys in the games that are are the ones that started out trying to do the right thing the the people that that fall the people that you know uh saruman or saruman you know like it, it's one of those things his fall hurts the hardest because he was corrupted you know uh and watching other people turn away from the ring or whatever the ring is in that world you can see most of these things like all these things were set up to protect the people and then over time that was forgot and just became this is how we control the people we've always done this so it 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 hurts it hurts like to look at that and i think you get a little bit out of the season two of what i've seen when they're dealing with the miners with the people picking out like harvesting military stacks and melting them down for drugs so you could like you're so bored with your life that you want to experience other people's deaths i mean it's just like Oh my gosh, the trip is crazy. Yeah, and, and it really goes into the the theme of transhumanity. Uh, transhumanity is a new form of new human, so altered from its original biological state that it has changed the very nature of human existence. Um, entire minds can be saved, stored and transferred from one host body to the next. Physical bodies, some spliced with animal genes and augmented with uh, cybernetic advancements, are little more than vehicles for digitalized minds. I mean, really, if you think about it, the cortical stack... Um, or the digital human freight or the stack, whatever you want to call it, um, was, I mean, the metal that they created or used to create it was from the Martians. It was the alloy that they found from the Martians. And you have been reduced to a series of code, which is, I mean, which is horrifying if you think about it. Like literally your stack can be inserted into any sleeve and suddenly, you know, I mean, here's Patrick in the sleeve of an old woman or an old man or a young child or and, and I'm in the body of a child with the mind of a 46 year old or the experiences of a 46 year old. And I mean, if you're rich enough in altered carbon, you don't care. You can do whatever you want. I th And uh, yeah. that's scary. 
I think it fills in something that I always have an issue with now is uh, we do it now with MMOs, right? You sit down, you create your character, you play as that character, people know you as that character. Very few people in game know me as Nolan, they know me as my avatar, right? And I think it's been that way for years is, you know, you see that with Twitch streamers, you know, it's not, uh, you know, it's not so-and-so, it's, you know, it's Bike Man or Elohim or Co Carnage. That's not their real name, but that's their their internet personality. So we, we come down to that point of uh, who are we, right? Who are we? Am I my body? If I lose my arm, am I less me? No, you know, you are your mind. And so we're, we, we do that a little bit now and, and seeing it taken to this extreme, um, I would like the first thing for me, I'm so small minded. I was like, can you imagine going on vacation? Like how sweet would that be? I'm going to sit back in my chair. I'm going to upload and I'm going to shoot my ass to Hawaii, rent a body, go surfing for the day and come home, you know, not thinking about world takeover, not thinking about <laughs> how am I going to be in five different places at the same time, you know, securing drugs. Like I was just like, dude, can you imagine just travel or visiting? Uh, I, it also goes back to, uh, like the matrix, like what a perfect way for an old folks home, right? I would love to have my great grandfather be able to play catch with his great grandson in his prime in his body mentally, you know what I mean? Like experience that, you know, experience people in their prime. But again, how far does it go to people all of a sudden? I think I'm just going to live here because it's better than reality. Uh, I don't, it, it's awesome. Yeah, so in Altered Carbon, um, they they show a really good example of this where uh, Ortega's grandmother spun up, and that's what they call it when they take your stack and put it in a new sleeve. It's called being spun up. Uh, Ortega's grandmother is spun up and put into the body of a male criminal, and she goes to whatever holiday is, I think it was Day of the Dead, actually, that they were celebrating. And then at the end of it, you know, the grandmother tells Ortega, hey, I don't want to be spun up anymore. Let me go. It's time for me to, to be done mm -hmm. and experience real death. Um, so, and, and again, you can be whatever. And I like the, the reference that you make to MMOs because it really is true. Like I jump in, I play my demon hunter. People don't know Patrick. They see Kiela. They don't see Patrick. And I think that's fascinating when you think, because I never even thought about it that way. Um, yeah. And like the whole, in the Matrix, I know Kung Fu. I mean, God, how, how popular was that line all of a sudden? And it was literally, you know, just a quick moment of uploading. Now, that isn't in Altered Carbon, so I don't want anybody to think that, oh, I can just learn something. No, that's not it. But that really leans to the cyberpunk aspect that you were talking about with The Matrix. Well, in, in some ways, uh, what was it the, in, in the second season, the people hunting him could, like, smell him because they were spliced with wolf blood? And they had like pack tactics and you know what I mean? Like, so the, the augmentations at that point are not necessarily, I'm not going to upload you and teach you how to know Kung Fu. I'm going to give you a cyber arm that punches through walls or, you know, like you don't need to know right. Kung Fu. You just grab somebody. And so the, right. again, it, it's those little splices that, uh, like you said, start taking away from who you are. It's that and trans think, humanity. Yep. Yeah, and I and I think it's fascinating. I love the fact that here, like like you said, suddenly I'm I'm a human, but I have the olfactory nerves and, and senses of a wolf, and I can smell you a mile away. Right. How how far would you go? You know what I mean? Like that's the biggest thing is people would not know when to stop. And we could see that with plastic surgery, right? We have some of these minor basic situations where we get baby glimpses of this. Uh, and people go to the extremes. People become their EverQuest avatars. I mean, there's stories of kids being ignored because their dad's playing EverQuest. The kid goes in and deletes his character out of spite, and the dad kills himself. Like, you know what I mean? Right. Like, like yeah. those, those are wow, the things. Wow, we got dark quick. I'm just saying, like, that's that's how deep it goes. You see the people who, uh, you know, makeup is like the most basic form of a plastic surgery just goes insane. You know, it's like. At what point is it the balance of, uh, again, I'm all for it because I, I do believe you are who you are on the inside. Um, and if you need to do something to make the exterior match the interior, I'm good with it from a good standpoint. But if it's from a negative standpoint, you know, I, I can see it going too far. So I, right. I think that's why we work and out, right? That's why we, you know, read books. We try and better, we try and better the inside. Uh, and then sometimes the inside doesn't feel good if the outside feels bad. So, 
Right. And and I think it's interesting, you know, you draw a lot of references to like MMOs that we play because I guess that really is a kind of a neat way to think about it. Um, I do remember um, back in uh, Wrath days where there was a couple of psychologists or, or psychiatrists, sorry, who set up characters so they could have inline or online therapy sessions with players. And I thought that was fascinating that somebody even thought to do that. I was kind of blown away by it, but I thought it was really fascinating. Well, again, I, I think that's the thing of, you know, you can be accepted for you, not based upon looks. People don't look at my night elf and like me better. Like, it's just what they say, oh, I really like your transmog. What made you do that? Then they want to know more about you and your personality. So there's a freedom to it. Uh, and with that freedom, there is. again, it's uh, as long as it's, you know, in its genuine, pure form, it's great. But how far do right. people go? Right. And when you start doing this whole transhumanity, things get really weird. Um, so the things I wanted to talk about, of course, there's obviously the dystopian faction of Altered Carbon. It is in the future. It is in a very brutal, rough, dark, grimy future. So uh, you're going to have that dystopian aspect. And I think it's interesting because we do see a lot of, there's a lot of movies that talk about a dystopian future. Mad Max is a great example of a dystopian future. And there's a lot of RPGs that deal with dystopian future. Cyberpunk is a great example of a dystopian future. Um, there's an... Uh, I'm drawing a blank. Dystopia is the name of the game from um, Ald uh, Onyx Path that deals with a dystopian future. So there's some really interesting stuff when it comes to a dystopian future where things just aren't, I mean, it doesn't matter anymore. The, uh, uh, everyone is a prisoner. No matter what you do, you can't break away from the corporations or the UN or, or the protectorate, which is the UN. Um, so just that's another theme that is present in Altered Carbon. And I, and I, I don't know. I thought it was really fascinating. Absolutely agree. It's, I think we get that now, right? You wake up, you go to work, yeah. you go home. You didn't really you, feel like it. Yeah. So I think that's the thing of now it's again, amplified to 11 and that's, that's kind of it. And, and once you have that, you know, it's, what does it people say? Uh, if you want to do an extreme sport, go skydiving last because everything else is ruined from that point on. And, and that's this world, right? It's like, hey, you, wanna, you want to feel this, know this, experience this, great, do it. Now, you know, petting a dog doesn't feel as great because you've, you know, you've rode a mastodon, you know, in your mind. Or, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, you know, at this point, like, why would you ever ride a horse when you could go ride a tiger, you know, or whatever, like the, the basics of life now all of a sudden are like, you know, we take it for granted. Yeah, I agree. Uh, some concepts I wanted to discuss just real quickly, because we are coming to the end of our time here, um, is is some of, uh, sorry, some of the core concepts of Altered Carbon. The first being, and no one has mentioned it, and I've mentioned it a little bit, uh, and that being the Protectorate. Now, what I think is fascinating, and I love that they've done this, is that the Protectorate is like the big global all controlling kind of uh, deal. And it is quite literally the United Nations. The United Nations was formed after the Second World War. And I remember I was, as I was reading this, I'm like, huh? Wait, what? What? And it dawned on me that they're literally talking about the UN, the United Nations. And that once we started leaving um, Earth, they became this, this protectorate. And that oversees everything. And the only thing that can oversee, or not oversee, but even combat it, are the corporations. And that's the mega corporations. And there's only a few. And you see that... Um, Kovac is an envoy, and the envoys were the they were the special elite soldiers of the Protectorate. So you do get to see that in the show. Yeah, it's I, I keep going back to your you know the the Star Trek versus this here. I has there really been any enemies outside of humanity in this world? Like I feel like there and. I, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, I feel, yeah. like, I feel like with Star Trek, like, it's like, you have all this technology, let's band together and explore. And there's still threats out there. So we have to band together. And I feel like with this here, they've, hey, let's band together. This is great. Blah, blah, blah. We explore the world. Wow. We literally are top of the food chain again. Let's treat every, you know what I mean? When there's no fear to bring us together, they won't. And that's kind of what I feel like with this here. It's like, you know, they're out here doing this stuff and trying to protect things, but it really seems like the only thing they really fight is corporations. 
Yeah, and it's interesting because, like, in, as I'm reading Broken Angels, there's this war going on, and it's between the Kempis, which are all humans, and the and the Protectorate. And so you have this, and, and you talk about you talk about dystopian and and grimy and gritty, like, and you mentioned this in the second season. You see people harvesting the stacks out of the fallen soldiers, and that is literally what they do. They go out there. Oh, okay, this person suffered. Um, biological death meaning their sleeve has been destroyed to the point that it cannot go on let's just go ahead and pull the stack insert it into another sleeve so imagine the the toll that would take on you mentally to know that you died now you're back in another body and you may very well die again and you can die multiple times as a soldier and and imagine the the almost fearlessness it would give you as a soldier and this is some of the stuff that you deal with in altered carbon it's like yeah i know i'm there's a very real chance that my body is going to get destroyed in this fight but as long as my stack is protected as long as i don't suffer real death i'm fine just pull my stack and put me in another sleeve yeah and i think that you uh you saw that with uh different wars where they'd load soldiers up with drugs right so they weren't afraid right. is that even more scary you know or if you've got a backup somewhere and there's no fear of dying, I don't even want to know what that, uh, I don't even want to know what that war looks like. Yeah, I don't either. Um, gosh, you know, there's, there's a lot to cover in this book. It is. And I think that's the cool thing about it. Like I said, I, I learned a lot more just kind of about, uh, the world itself. I know that I don't know why I never put together the connection between the UN and the protectorate. Uh, the corporations make sense. Uh, the city itself, Bay City, is San Francisco, which I never, I mean, I guess it makes sense. Like, it's so obvious, but it was so far futuristic that there's nothing you recognize, really, I guess. So it's just like. Yep. And I, I think Bay City is San Francisco and Oakland finally coming together as one. Yeah. Uh, they were talking about, like, the bridge is still there, but because everybody has flying right. cars, it turned into, like, homes or something like that. Uh, <laughs> like, I, it's cool. I Yeah. It's a cool world. The technology is fascinating. Uh, the I, I would like to see a campaign ran through it of playing the same character, bouncing through, because uh, every experience you would learn something, and then every time you spin up, you've got a new body and this new crap to deal with. Uh, the baggage, you know, the baggage seems fascinating. Whether it is your body's modified or trying to be a human that's got a little bit of, you know. Uh, a wolf in them and you you're only focused on this one thing so i <laughs> i don't know it's it's awesome I, I i say if you have the book and you read the section that tells you to skip over the section because you like the show you're a fan of what's going on please don't uh there's a lot of information that i didn't know um and the lore notes on each little situation that talk about it they kind of explain a little bit more as well uh, like uh, or Ortega's really nice house was kind of a, a, a gift <laughs> that was kind of swept under the rug because uh, the protectorate got what they wanted, you know, so it's like not everybody's good, not everybody's evil. And, and that's probably the downfall of society here is because everybody really is looking out for themselves. Right, right, exactly. So well, guys, um, I think we're probably going to jump back into Alter Carbon next week because there's so much more to cover. We'd like to talk about the system a little bit because it is a little different uh, with the dice rolls and stuff. So we thought we'd go into that a little bit more. Uh, plus, just gives us another subject to talk about and finish January off with Alter Carbon. So we will be looking ahead to February to figure out what we're going to be talking about there. I did notice as, as we were sitting here, I got an email from um, Hunter's Entertainment or a tweet. Sorry, I saw a tweet from Hunter's Entertainment that that Gods of Metal Ragnarok is about to launch on Kickstarter. Uh, that is also something that we're trying to get a hold of Hunter's Entertainment about to bring a writer on to discuss that game as well. So that is going to be our show for this week. I do want to take a moment and just give a shout out to everybody who is chatting in, in Twitch today. Thank you so much for, for being here and, and putting up with our bullshit and chatting with us here on Twitch. It's awesome to see so much traffic in the Twitch chat. Really appreciate that. Um, and Jackson, I will be getting a hold of you soon and letting you know uh, when, when, or what time Wednesday works because we will be discussing Eye of the Beholder. Nolan, do you have anything else before we call it a day? I don't. Uh, we will get this up uh, as a podcast. We also have a YouTube going as well. Uh, so that way if it's one of those things that you can't catch us live since we do it fairly early and we know we get people from all over the place, uh, we're over there as well. So again, it, it's been fun. It's nice uh, getting to chat with people. We do appreciate it a lot. 
uh, and looking forward to hopefully getting some cool interviews coming up with some games that we haven't seen before. I, you know, the, the Scion stuff I, I'm not familiar with. I would love to know more about it because first st- anything that gets what funded in a day, right? Or, yeah, in an hour. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's got a following and, and we probably need to give it a little more attention because uh, it's clearly popular. So I, again, thanks everybody. We appreciate it. Yep, absolutely. Guys, thank you so much for joining us this week. We will catch you next Sunday. Bye.